Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, October 14th. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. Our topic today is Picture Book Month and Celebration of Diane de las Casas. Our special guests are Tara Lazar and Katie Davis. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula who will now introduce Tara and ask her the newbie question. Hello, everyone. This is Paula Nauga joining in from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am very excited to have Tara with us um, and to honor my dear friend, Diane Villacasas, who is the founder of Picture Book Month. Author Tara Lazara has six picture books in print with many more to come. Her latest title, 789, The Untold Story from Disney Hyperin. Last fall, he <clears throat> took her illustrated dictionary, 500 words to befumble your teachers and bamboozle your frenemies, are now in print. Sarah is the founder of StoryStorm, a writer's brainstorming challenge formerly known as Picture Book Idea Month. <clears throat> she is a picture book mentor for We Need Diverse Books and the co-chair of the Rutgers University Council on Children's Literature Annual Conference. Katie Davis, who is not able to join us in person but has a video that we will see later, says her secret superpower is her ability to teach non-techy and tech-fearful writers how to be better business people by building their platforms through social media, video, and creating building mailing lists. Katie has been honored to speak everywhere from a maximum security prison to elementary schools to university level, including UConn and Yale, and his keynoted conferences and fundraising galas. You can subscribe to Katie's YouTube channel at katiedavis.tv or by going and go listen to a podcast at katiedavis.tv forward slash podcast. Katie Davis's books, published by Harcourt SNS, Harper Collin, and Diversion Books, have sold over 755,000 copies, which is why she's published How to Promote Your Children's Book, a marketing guide for writers that debuted, debuted at number one on Amazon. So, Tara, the newbie question for you today is, why are pictures, picture books, important to readers of all ages? <clears throat> well, thank you. Oh, gosh. Ah, my phone is ringing. Oh, my goodness. What a good time for my phone to ring. Um, so, why are picture books important to readers of all ages? This is a question that I think could be answered for days. <laughs> um, I like to say, and you will see this in my slide, that um, picture books are important because they remind all of us that anything is possible. And you will see that in picture books. Picture books use imagination and creativity and just show us all kinds of worlds. And, it, and I, come on, who doesn't like looking at the pictures? When I was in second grade, um, I was devastated when the teacher told me, oh, no, 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 you're too old for picture books now. You have to read these books. And she showed me a novel. It wasn't really that many chapter books at that time, but she showed me a novel, and it didn't have any pictures in it. And I was very upset. Um, children use the pictures to help them tell the story, help understand the story. And before they can even read, they will look at those pictures, and it will help them understand the story before they know the words. So. Yes, somebody is saying, Paula is saying no one is ever too old for picture books. I totally agree. And I go around preaching this to everyone. Um, 
So we are here today to talk about Picture Book Month, which was the brainchild of Diane. And it started about seven years ago, which was seven or maybe six. I don't even know how many years ago it started. But um, Diane called me up on the phone one day. And she said, um, I really have a great idea. Um, we should make November Picture Book Month a celebration of picture books. And in part, she got that idea because I had started an event for writers called Picture Book Idea Month, or very complicatingly, which isn't even a word, um, P Bo Id Mo. That's what I called it because some of you may be aware of National Novel Writing Month. Maybe, maybe not. National Novel Writing Month has been going on in November for at least 10 years now. Um, a dozen years, maybe even, maybe even more than that. Maybe I should have looked up how many years it's been going on, but yes, National Novel Writing Month was in November, and people, writers were challenged to come up with 50,000 words to make a novel in 30 days, which is incredible, but it really gets what we call your butt in chair and gets you writing. So um, what was happening with National Novel Writing Month, it would come around in November, and I would see all my writer friends online talking about it and like, oh, I wrote 2,000 words today. I feel so accomplished. This is great motivation. And they would chat with one another, and they'd talk about what they were writing and how much they were getting done and how exciting it was and how creative it was. And you know what? I was really jealous because I didn't write novels. And so I couldn't participate in this event. So in November of 2009, I said, well, what if I start an event that's like National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo is what they call it for short. So I said, okay, well, writing a picture book in a month isn't much of a challenge. And writing one a day is a little too much of a challenge. <laughs> Be a little crazy there. So I said, well, the most important thing in a picture book is its concept. So maybe I hold an event where picture book writers are challenged to come up with a single concept a day so that by the end of November, you have 30 bright and shiny new ideas for picture books, and you could keep them in a nice little book, and it would inspire you throughout the year. So that's what I decided to do. I started Picture Book Idea Month. And since everybody called National Novel Writing Month NaNoWriMo, I called my Pibo Inmo. Um, <laughs> and I started it in 2009. And this kind of gave Diane the idea that, hey, we need just a picture book month. Forget about something for writers. You're already doing that, Tara. And I've done that every year since 2009. And very recently, in fact, last year, I changed the name, because who can understand what Pibo Idmo is if you hear that the first time? No, nobody can understand it, especially not teachers. And I'd love teachers and their students to join in in the fun. Um, it's just coming up with ideas. So also, November is a very busy month. Um, we're getting ready for the holidays. There's Thanksgiving. There's a lot of cooking going on. So I moved it to January. And I changed the name. It's now called Story Storm. I kind of combined the idea of brainstorming with story ideas and came up with the word Story Storm. I now hold it in January. And yes, I know there's 31 days in January. But it's still 30 ideas in 30 days. And the 31 days is just that little extra day if you need it. Um, 
So this is something that I started. It's for writers. It's for teachers to participate with their students. And all it is is coming up with an idea a day for a picture book story. Or if your students are doing it, for any story that they want to write. And um, so it goes on in January. And every day on my website, which you'll see at the bottom there, is taralazar.com. I provide inspiration help. I have a published author or illustrator or maybe an editor or an agent, somebody who works in children's literature, sometimes it's a, a children's librarian, um, post uh, something that they do to help them get inspired. And this is your little push for the day. You read that and you write down a story idea. And that's all it is. It doesn't take a lot of time. Doesn't take a lot of effort. It just, um, your ideas grow during the month. One idea builds on another idea. And it's just a really, um, great event to get your students interested in, um, in conjunction with also in November celebrating Picture Book Month, uh, and, and reading picture books together. And, um, just enjoying them and talking about story and learning about story elements, character and setting and personification if we want to get really difficult. Um, it depends what age your students are. But um, so my story storm is in January. Now, this is what I said earlier. Picture books are important because they remind us that anything is possible. Oh! Is that true? Well, I like to think it's true. <laughs> it may not be true in reality, but I love to think that it's true. And I love to read picture books for all the silly and creative things they teach us. Um, most picture books have some kind of underlying emotional core in them, a problem that children can relate to. Um, and this is what makes them such great tools to teach kids because any picture book that gets published today, um, we're making sure as writers, as editors, as publishers, that those books have something in them that kids are going to love. Um, whether it be a subject like Mac truck, big a digger, you know, the, the, oh, they, the kids love diggers, or a garbage truck, or a cement mixer, like trucks, or princesses, or ballerinas, or robots, or aliens, or cute fluffy puppies, or hamsters, or skateboards, bicycles, whatever it is, every picture book is going to have something on that cover that's going to make a child be like, oh, I have to read this. But inside the book, there's always an emotional core running through the story. So the kids learn something as well. I'm going to use an example of my book, The Monster. It's a store where you make monsters. Oh, where you buy monsters, not make them, you buy it. Store where you buy monsters, the mon store. This is this book is always very popular um, around this time of year because it's Halloween. I didn't write it as a Halloween book, but people are like, monsters are perfect for Halloween. So in the mon store, there's a boy, Zach, who just wants to keep his pesky little sister Gracie out of his room. So he goes to the mon store to buy a monster to scare her away. But guess what? It doesn't work. Gracie and the monster become friends. And Zach goes back to the monster store and tries to return his monster. But the monster store manager says, sorry, no returns, no exchanges. <gasps> he can't return his monster. So Zach ends up buying a whole load of monsters to try to scare Gracie, and it just doesn't work. But in the end, I'm not going to tell you how it ends up, but I will tell you, in the end of the story, 
these two siblings who are always, you know, contentious, <laughs> um, finally cooperate in the end. So the end result of this story that's really about monsters on the surface, the underlying core is cooperation, that siblings don't have to be rivals all the time. They can cooperate. They can be friends. Um, and that's what's so great about picture books, because kids don't even realize that little lesson is going on because it doesn't hit them over the head. I don't say in the book, now children are good cooperators. No, I just show that Gracie and Zach are finally getting along. And I'm not going to tell you what happens at the end because it's too fun to read. So, sorry. Sorry, I'm leaving you hanging. Um, <laughs> there is, oh, yeah, I see Peggy just um, uh, put up. There is a teacher's guide to the Mon store. Um, so there are some fun activities. A teacher just tweeted at me the other day that for her first graders, she made a fun activity after she read the monster. She had them draw a picture of their favorite monster from the monster, and there's tons of them because he keeps going back and buying monsters. And then write down the adjectives to describe that monster, and that was an activity for first grade. And, you know, depending on whatever grade you teach, there's a load of activities there in the teacher's guide. But um, that's why picture books are so important. I have a few more reasons why they are important. But really, I can talk about this all day long. Um, I, I spoke about this before. Um, you, a child can read a picture book before they can read words. They look at the pictures. They see, they see the progression of the story. People don't believe me when I say this, but I distinctly remember learning how to read by reading picture books with my mother. She would read them aloud, and I would hear certain words repeated, like the, the, was the first word I ever learned how to read because I, I realized she was reading that word the way it was repeated throughout the story, and I began to recognize it. And that's what kids do. They start to recognize the words as their parent is reading it. A lot of picture books have repetitive refrains. Some character says something often. Um, I have a book called Little Red Gliding Hood. She's not a riding hood. She's a gliding hood. She's a skater. And she has a little catchphrase. And it was, um, oh, slippery slash. That's her catchphrase. And it's repeated throughout the book. And the kids know when that catchphrase comes that something is going to happen or maybe something just happened. So, um, Kids will read the pictures first, then learn the words. Picture books also teach story elements. Um, kids are able to recognize what makes a good story. There's always a problem and a solution. There are typically multiple attempts to solve that problem. Um, characters have certain traits and personalities. Uh, there's certain story settings, like Little Red Gliding Hood is a figure skater, so it had to take place in a wintry wonderland. And if you open the first page of that book, people say to me, oh, this looks like Candyland in the winter. And it really does, because it's uh, the path of the frozen river that she skates on. But um, so kids learn story elements. They learn imagination and creativity. For Little Red Gliding Hood, I took about, there's at least 20 different um, fairy tales and nursery rhymes that are mashed into that story. Because think about it. Little Red Riding Hood, there's a big bad wolf. The three little pigs, there's a big bad wolf. Why can't they all be in the same story? Um, so kids get to see how you can kind of mash things together. 
Um, they see how you can envision a story differently. There's also in picture books action and reaction. How a character acts and how another character acts in relation to them. That's just like real life. Um, so that's another thing that children learn that is important to developing your characters for your story, actions and reactions. And this is being talked about a lot these days because I am a picture book mentor for We Need Diverse Books. Kids want to see themselves in books as well as see other cultures and how other people live. And what we call that in the industry is mirrors and windows. Mirrors because we see ourselves reflected back, and windows because we're looking into another world that we really don't know much about. Um, there's been a lack of characters of color in picture books, and even females. There's been a real um, lack of them in picture books. So. Uh, this has been pointed out within the last couple of years, and the industry as a whole is trying to embrace many different cultures, many different ethnicities, many different religions in picture books. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm active with We Need Diverse Books. I actually am Jewish, so not a whole lot of Jewish-centric books unless you're going to a publisher like Carbin. Um, and what I'm doing as a mentor is I'm helping an aspiring writer get their manuscripts in shape so that they can break into the industry. And that's kind of my job right now through the year of 2017. And because we're seeing so many mirrors and windows in books now, books teach children empathy. And don't we need a whole lot more empathy these days? I think so. Um, I read an article very recently that said uh, adults who read regularly have more empathy. Empathy is taught by reading fiction because we get to understand characters and we get to relate to characters through the emotions that they uh, display. And same thing with children and picture books. Remember I'm talking about that emotional core that runs through most picture books? Picture books aren't just silly for the sake of being silly. There is an emotional bond that that kid can make with that book, and they can really relate to it. Like the feeling you have when you lose a favorite toy. Everybody can relate to that, right? So that's why the book Knuffle Bunny by Mo Willems is so popular because everybody can relate to that situation. So um, picture books are great at teaching empathy to children. And that's another reason why they are so fantastic. But um, I'm kind of done talking now because I talk a lot. <laughs> Um, so why don't we play Katie's video right now before we go to uh, John. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Davis. I'm really sorry I can't be there live. I wish I could be, but I'm here on video. So I'm going to give you a little background by way of introduction um, because basically it's because of my background that I became friends with Diane and I got involved with Picture Book Month. I am an author and an illustrator. Teachers, you guys might know my first book, Who Hops, um, or Kindergarten Rocks. And I'm the director of the Institute for Writers and the Institute of Children's Literature, or ICL. And ICL's almost 50 years old, and my husband and I um, took over the schools about two years ago because of our love of children's books. So anyway, um, we offer college level writing courses and college credits and that might be good news for educators because does it, I think that turns into professional development credits. Um, we're still learning about that part of the business, but we are teaching writing and that's what we're passionate about. Um, and I've talked a lot about that with Diane. So about Diane. You know how when 
someone passes, everybody says, oh, they were one of a kind, they were one of a kind, but really, Diane, she really, she was really, there was no one like Diane. I'm gonna tell you some things I loved about her. Her smile, it was completely infectious. Her laugh came from deep, deep, deep inside her. She was open and trusting and loving. Um, I loved how she told my kids stories as though there were an entire huge audience when she stayed at my house, and I only have two kids. Um, and how when I stayed at her kids, she snoozed the morning away because she was a complete night owl. She snoozed the morning away while her youngest daughter, Eliana, who at the time I think was nine, um, made me the best frittata on the planet and could barely carry the cast iron pan that she made it in. Um, I loved her crazy painted fingernails that were like this long. Uh, and how she only always wore dresses. I never, in all the years I knew her, never saw her anything but dresses. And four inch heels. I'm a sneaker girl, I'm a boot girl, like cowboy boots. She's, she's all high heels, even if she's walking all around New York City. And her eyelashes don't even start. She put on these eyelashes, whoosh, whoosh, every time she blinked, you would, fall over from the breeze that created <laughs> they were, she was very glamorous and um and her storytelling and her love of children's books i loved that about her and everyone loved that about her and her generosity was renowned because she created picture book month f out of that generosity and the love of literacy and children's books um, she was a regular con um, contributor to my first podcast, Brain Burps About Books. And the last time we talked, um, it was right when we took over the Institute of Children's Literature. And I wanted to brainstorm with Diane on how that could, how Picture Book Month could benefit from that. Uh, I've spoken to some of the other founders and to the person who's been assisting Diane with Picture Book Month. And I hope to talk to John and the girls to see what the status is and what they want the future to be because Picture Book Month is Diane's legacy. She, it was, she was the tornado driving force behind it uh, in the picture book world. And it's her legacy and it's a beautiful, beautiful legacy. So I hope you will support it. I know you'll support it because it's great. It's great for educators. Um, and thank you so much for listening and have a great day. There's some amazing people here today. I am sitting next to John Perrette, who was um, the love of Diane's life for the last several years. And I'm going to speak a little bit about my connection to Diane, then I'm going to turn it over to John, and he's going to explain what he and Diane did in their collaboration. Diane De La Casas, I met uh, 18 years ago when she started coming to my elementary school as part of a grant where she did an author in residency every year with our students, and our students so look forward to her coming in every year. And she started out as a storyteller, and she was always very dramatic, and the life of the room, it just lit up when she started talking. And then she started publishing her own books, and the kids were so excited because we had a real live picture book author in our classroom, and they got to see her from one year to the next. And they were like, Miss Diane's coming, Miss Diane's coming. So they were always excited to see her. And she did such wonderful activities with them, such as teaching them how to um, do um, storybooks, what she called her twisted tales. And she had them make game boards that went with different picture books, and just all sorts of fun activities. And she wrote an awesome blog of all of her experiences as author in residence. And she always took great pictures and put them on. And, and the kids were like, I got on Diane's blog, you know. 
And I remember one time when I was just learning how to Skype, Diane rushed up into my room. She wasn't scheduled to be in my room. But she said, um, I need to do a Skype call to Philadelphia, Paula. And she goes, I know you know how to Skype, so I came to your room to do it. So uh, my kids and I sat in while she used my board, my Promethean board, to Skype into a uh, kindergarten class in Philadelphia to read one of her books to them. And it was really great. And those are the kind of things. Diane became uh, an adopted member of our faculty, and she came to our Christmas parties every year and our end of the year parties and any kind of activities, social activities we had during the year. So um, we are, I am passionate about trying to make sure that we extend Picture Book Month and keep it going as part of Diane's legacy. So now I'm going to turn the mic over to John, who's going to give you a little bit of his back story to tell how he met Diane and what Diane got him involved in. Hello, everyone. I'm John Corrett. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. I think this is absolutely wonderful. So a uh, little bit about how Diane and I came to be. Well, she's a storyteller, so I'll share a brief story with you. Uh, I met Diane uh, back in July two years ago. Uh, there was a small restaurant in Metairie that we met up with, at, that we enjoyed going to. Uh, it was a Cuban restaurant. And when I met Diane, I was completely blind. I could not see. I had one of my friends drop me off because I had an accident where I was blind for almost a year before she and I even met. But the amazing thing was that upon meeting me, she never, she never judged any of that. You know, she always knew that my sight would eventually improve, which thankfully it has. And she helped me with that process. And once I got to seeing better, I began to realize what was more important to me. And I, I didn't want to go back to my old business. So she somehow convinced me <laughs> to get into writing. And I shared some of my childhood with her uh, about how I had been bullied as, as a boy because uh, I have lazy eyes. And we came up with this idea about starting an anti-bully uh, book, uh, which is the picture that you all probably see there, Captain Deadeye. And it was a wonderful collaboration. I had no idea what I was doing, but she took me by the hand and introduced me to this wonderful world. And in two years, we visited schools in Las Vegas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. We did uh, American Library Association Conference in Chicago. Uh, we had things lined up in New York, Florida, Alabama. She was uh, a firecracker, if there ever were one. And I miss her dearly. Um, I know that our book and our mission was important to her, and that's why I continue to find ways to keep that going as she would want me to. And also, um, Picture Book Month, which uh, was always her passion. And with all my heart, I wish that I had a better handle on what she did. There were just so many things um, that I learned over our, our two-year relationship. Um, but I know it's a wonderful initiative. I know anyone involved, you're all beautiful people. Uh, you know, she never, she never met a stranger, right? So um, I'm going to turn this back over to Paula. I'm not going to get choked up on here, but, mm -hmm. but I, I sincerely appreciate every one of you. Thank you so much. I love you all. John, would you take a moment? I love the story about when you met Diane, you were considered legally blind. And so what did you think? Just her presence of walking into the restaurant okay. tells about Diane's presence to everyone, whether they're sighted or not. Well, I, I love that story. I, I, I can tell you, you share? the restaurant had a little bell at the door, and when my buddy dropped me off, because, again, I could not see anything, I said, just face me in the direction of the door. So I heard the little bell open, you know, the door opens up, and I smelled perfume. And then I heard the sound of those four inch heels you were talking about <laughs> clip plopping across the room. And she says, are you John? And all I did was look in the direction of her voice. And I said, please have a seat. <laughs> uh, I promise you, I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not destitute, but I can't see a thing. So sit close to me, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and I can tell you that date went from the restaurant to Barnes & Noble, where uh, she drove, thankfully. And I was introduced to one of her books, The Little Red Hen. She sang it to me right there in the Barnes & Noble. And I didn't know what to do, but I couldn't see where I was going, so I thought I should stick around. And I'm glad I did, because it worked out really well. Um, yes. 
Okay, and can you tell us a little bit more about um, what you were doing as a speaker with um, yeah. stuff? Yeah, so uh, before I met Diane, I worked in the automotive industry, and I would held a bunch of different seats, and eventually I uh, became a general manager, so what I would do is train salespeople, you know, and I tried to do it differently, um, you know, I taught them that sincerity out, outlasts salesmanship, and just to find a way to care about your people, but we were able to segue that into me uh, doing speaking engagements. So uh, one of our dear friends, uh, Janet Perez at St. Bernard Paris Library, uh, gave me an opportunity to speak to some folks there, and it just started to catch on. In fact, my first book, uh, my Breaking Barriers book, which I really <laughs> just wrote because Diane convinced me it would be a great way to get the feelings out. I never had any intention of selling it or any of that stuff, but... Um, she, she did convince me to, to put it down on paper, and after that first speaking engagement, uh, everyone wanted a copy of the book. So we got to work on it, and, man, we had that thing done in, like, two months. Um, and, and, yeah, that, that's taken us a bunch of places, too. So, Well, we love that you were here and that you were able to come and join us today for the webinar. I am so thankful that I got to know you through Diane, and I hope that we continue to be good buddies in the coming years, and I'm excited to see what follows with your book series for Children's Lit. Okay, Peggy, I'm going to turn it over to the questions and the answer session now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Paula and John. I did capture some questions as we went along. Let's see. Tara, can you share tips for parents, teachers, about how to decide what kinds of things to ask kids when you are reading picture books? Things that make them think, but don't just tell them what they are seeing. Um, it's really a great idea to read the book first when your kid isn't around so you know what's coming. Um, there's a lot of anticipation with picture books. We write picture books with that in mind that the page turns are going to be very surprising. And it's a fun thing to ask the kids, what do you think is going to happen next? <gasps> and they can help anticipate what is coming next. Um, and, and that teaches them a lot about story development and, you know, surprises, and it's just a really fun thing to do. Also, there's times when the kids are going to ask, what does that mean? Um, we use words in picture books that are bigger words um, because the kids can handle it, and we put them in context so that the kids can understand. So um, answering any questions that the kid might have along the way, about, you know, what does this word mean, asking them, well, what do you think it means if I read this sentence again and we look at the pictures and, you know, try to decide what's happening, what do you think it's, it means? This learning a new word by context is a great tool in a picture book because this is something, this is a skill that you have the rest of your life when you're reading. You, you're always coming across new words, right? <laughs> I have this book coming up um, called 500 Words to Bumfuzzle Your Teachers and Bamboozle Your Frenemies. Now, I don't know if that's the final title. We're still working on the title. But there's all these really fun words, and I use them in context in the book. It's an illustrated dictionary. We we use this skill for a lifetime, and they're really, that skill is first taught in a picture book. So these are just some things that, you know, you can ask about a anticipating what comes next and, and helping kids learn more difficult words that are in the picture books because we don't shy away from big words in picture books. It's not an easy reader. It's not meant for the child to read alone until they're a more proficient reader. Picture books, we really think, are for adults to read with children and to make it a very fun bonding time. And that's what picture books are all about. Thanks, Tara. 
Uh, Peggy asked this and you typed yes, but I'll ask it so we can get a little lengthier answer. Uh, do you ever Skype calls or Google Hangouts with students to share your books? Uh, there are so many people from other countries here in the session or will watch the recording who would love that opportunity. And a related question, how can we connect with you for a Skype session with our students? Yes, I love Skype. Um, <laughs> I particularly like Skype because I can do it from the comfort of my home. And uh, what I do is I tell the kids that I wear jammies while I work. I mean, how many people would love to do that? So when the kids Skype with me, when a class Skypes with me, I'm wearing pajamas, and they get to guess what pajamas I'm going to wear. Um, I do a little magic trick with them that's involving an apple. I'm not going to tell you what that is. And I read my book, and I answer a few questions. I, I do free Skypes. Uh, 15, 20 minutes typically. Sometimes they go to a half hour. I'm not going to lie. I stay on the line a while until every kid has their uh, question answered. Um, and I do those free Skypes all the time. All you have to do is email me. And my email address is um, Tara Kidlet at gmail.com. And um, the, don't worry, on taralazar.com, my email is also there. So um, you can find out what my email is and just, you know, hey, we want to Skype next week. Are you available? And we'll come up with a time and, and we'll do it. I also do longer paid-for sessions where I teach kids about writing. Those are usually, you know, a 45-minute session or an hour session. I do those as well. But... Free Skypes to read my books. Yes, I do that all the time. That's great, Tara. Get your book month free, and can you access everything you need on the website? Absolutely. Um, Picture Book Month uh, has an ambassador every day. So somebody who is working in picture books that answers the question of the month, and typically um, the month that I participated, and I don't know if this is a question every month, was why are picture books important? And you guys already know, I already answered that several times. But um, so every day there is um, an ambassador who answers that question. There's a theme of picture book. Um, it's something free. You can log on every day and take a look at what picture books are recommended, what the theme is, talk about picture books. It is completely free, um, and that is P Diane's Picture Book Month. My Story Storm, also completely free, but that goes on in January, as I told you before. Um, but you just log into my website. There's a sign-up, um, and that's, that's about it. Thanks so much, Tara. Those were the questions I was able to capture. Does anyone else have a question for Tara or would like to share their experiences about picture books or picture book months? Shall we play the Jeopardy theme? Do, 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 <laughs> yes. do, 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 do. While we wait for questions. <laughs> well, yeah, I think questions have been taken care of, Tara. Again, thanks so much. For presenting Great. Today. Thank you for having I'm going me. to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Tara, you are delightful. That was such a fun conversation. And I just love your enthusiasm and your excitement about everything you do. I, who wouldn't want to have a Skype call with you? I want to get on the list, and I don't even have a class. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And we do have some great shows coming up. If any of you can come back, we're here almost every Saturday. And next week, 
we are hearing from the wonderful Rustin Hurley, who's going to be talking to us about tips for becoming a better teacher. Rustin has a great sense of humor, and he's so much fun to listen to, and he has awesome tips to share with us. October 28th, Sarah Thomas, who is now Dr. Sarah Thomas, is going to be joining us to talk about EduMatch and all the wonderful things they are doing. On November 4th, Kara Martin is going to tell us all about how she's using Snapchat for book snaps and gratitude snaps. I know that will be a great session. November 11th, Tiffany Whitehead, an amazing librarian, is going to be sharing some things about fake news and how we can help our students learn to figure out whether what they're reading is true or fake. Then November 18th, we have a wonderful session with Abby Futrell and Nancy Mangum um, that will be all about future ready schools and coaching fellow educators. Abby is a delightful, funny, humorous presenter, and I know that you're going to enjoy what and how she shares that day. No show on Thanksgiving weekend, but no, December 2nd, we're having Stephen Anderson, who's always wonderful, and he's going to be talking about accessible digital content for everyone. And December 9th, Shannon Miller, another fabulous librarian, is going to do a whole session just on Buncee for us. So come back every Saturday, and remember, we do record them, so if you can't make it to the live show, definitely tune in and watch the YouTube video or subscribe on iTunes. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hartigan's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where as long as your session is open to the public, you can have a free Blackboard Collaborate session. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link. You can also nominate yourself for a featured teacher of the month. The, um, as you exit the session today, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open up. And you can either take the link from within the chat, or there's a link in the live binder for the survey. At the bottom of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. Uh, if you do that, please use a personal email address. Otherwise, the uh, certificate might not get to you. Schools tend to block these from getting to you. Uh, thanks to Patty Ruffing for sending them out. And uh, thanks to her for having your name print on their certificate now. Special thanks again to uh, Kara Lazar, to uh, our video presenter, Katie, um, to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of Classroom 2.0, and um, to Blackboard Collaborate for our presentation platform. And thanks to everyone who, who uh, participated in the show today. Thanks for coming.